Hey, what's up guys? So a common question that I get in my comments is, if you worked in Wall Street, why don't you just do what you were doing at work, but at home? The reason why you can't just do what you're doing on Wall Street at home as a retail trader is because there is this barrier to entry to execute Wall Street strategies from home. Technology costs, sometimes inside information. I mean, maybe I wouldn't call it that, but you know, you're getting calls from brokers and stuff and it's like a lot of gray area information access to quant with PhDs from MIT. So the way I would describe it is Wall Street is like a well-fortified castle with a moat around it and a drawbridge. And within the courtyard in the castle is an orchard with all of these like healthy apples growing. And you can just pluck these low-hanging fruit. They're just everywhere. They just plop down on the floor. But outside of the castle and the moat is the rest of the world, the retail world. And it's highly competitive <laughs> and the trees are all barren and there's like a few high hanging fruits still remaining. So the way a retail trader would think about and construct strategies for how to pluck those high hanging fruit are going to be vastly different from the way uh, people within Wall Street are going to think about how to pluck the low hanging fruit. So the guy on the outside, the retail trader, he might deep dive on like one strategy, like swing trading or something, find ways, you know, I, I would compare that to, you know, building a ladder or something or building a trampoline. And the guy on the inside, they're not going to build ladders and trampolines. They're going to try to build like a Zamboni type of system where they can just ride on it and just pluck fruits and have them just fall into a basket on their Zamboni. You can understand how their efforts are in totally different directions. One isn't really that applicable to the other. So that's the first explanation as to why you can't just take what you know from trading within Wall Street and then apply it to being a retail trader once you're outside of the castle. Now that said, there are going to be people who try to use their alpha from working on a trade desk within Wall Street and try to apply it to their own personal account to make money. They use that knowledge to go on their phone and try to make some trades on Robinhood or whatever that they believe will have a positive expectation because of all the signals that they're getting at work from brokers or from their, their elaborate trading systems that are built off of quant models. Initially, uh, companies would allow this, but then eventually the compliance department at these companies started banning that practice because, well, one, it creates conflict of interest. You might make trades on your phone that you could have made at the trade desk at work, you know, prioritizing your own profits above the company's profits. And two, it's just a distraction, right? You're being paid to make money for the company. So when you're looking down all the time and like, you know, prioritizing your own personal account, like that's a distraction to the company. It means you're not trading as optimally for the company as they want you to. So... For those two reasons, and maybe more, the compliance department banned people from trading the same products that the company trades within their own personal accounts. Let's talk about Bitcoin. A lot of major trading firms like Jump Trading and DRW, they are pretty active in crypto. They have a lot of trading signals around whether they believe it's going to go up or down in the short term. With all of this investment into crypto, a lot of the traders asked the 401k administrators to allow Bitcoin to be added as one of the asset classes that you could invest in through your 401k. And there was a lot of debate over it, but then the 401k administrators within the company uh, eventually said no because they said it's too risky. So it's kind of interesting, right? Within a trading firm that already is heavily active with crypto, that they won't allow their traders to invest in Bitcoin in their own 401ks. But at the same time, I think the standards for risk within a 401k and within a trading desk are going to be vastly different. So I can understand that perspective. The larger point being that even within a quantitative trading firm, choices within your 401k are very conservative. So you have your standard S&P 500 funds and you have your international fund and a bond fund and a few target date funds. I just want to let people know that, that a lot of the quant traders within tier one trading firms, large percentage of their retirement savings are just sitting in very vanilla assets like the S&P 500. And even me personally, you know, I've answered this question multiple times in my comments, but I have the vast majority of my personal savings in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ and things like that. I'm a pretty vanilla investor with my own personal money, but I'm not actively trading it. Now let's talk about a couple of the other investments that quant traders tend to make. 
when uh, gold and silver were rallying like crazy. I want to say circa 2012. One of the traders from one of my previous trading firms that I worked at bought silver at the very top. I think silver was trading at like 45 or something. And he bought it to someone else who sold it at the top. So in defense of the other trader, they made that trade right at the top. But these guys, they're both excellent traders within their trading firms. Now it goes to show you that being an excellent trader within Wall Street doesn't mean that your miscellaneous speculations outside of Wall Street are going to go well. Another quant trader and portfolio manager, this guy has the Midas touch. Uh, he's a partner at the previous firm I worked at, but every trade desk they move him to, he just he just makes all the right decisions and then he turns losing trading desks into winning trading desks. They just like move him around, move him to London, move him here, move him there. And he just goes there and he, he, he figures out what's going on and then it becomes a profitable trading desk. But this guy who's such such a brilliant portfolio manager, he, he told a story during happy hour once where he got really caught up in trying to find these patterns in the uh, lean hogs and live cattle futures markets. And he said he blew out almost his whole net worth over some, uh, some futures trades. <laughs> Another partner at my previous firm, he's also a partner at uh, Revolution Brewery, which is one of the uh, breweries in Chicago. That's a bit more of a conservative investment, but a lot of these guys, these white guys from the Midwest, really like beer and breweries. They like this idea. At least two separate pit traders I know of, they made a couple of big bonuses and then they started their own breweries. So I think uh, for a lot of these traders, trading is just this way to make fast money. And then they eventually move on to a kind of chill job that they like. Another uh, quant trader I know of, he worked at the hedge fund division of the last firm I worked at. He worked on the index rebalancing team. For those of you who don't know, index rebalancing is when, say, the S&P 500 introduces a new uh, name. You know, like when Tesla joined the S&P 500, they have to push something out so that it stays 500 companies. A lot of big banks have this department that tries to forecast which names are going to join the S&P 500, which ones are going to get removed and try to get ahead of those moves because then you can make money from it, right? This guy is obsessed with real estate, particularly in Texas. And basically, every time he gets a big bonus, he's like, oh yeah, that's going straight into real estate, bro. And he just buys new properties. He owns a ton of them outside of like Houston, Dallas, Austin. And I think his wife is sort of like the property manager. She just kind of manages it part time. So he's just slowly building up his real estate empire in Texas. And he's been doing this for a while. So he's probably up a lot of money on it. Another large percentage of quant traders will just invest in other people's startups. I think that's a fun way to spend your money, but you know, it's high risk, high reward, which I guess is no surprise since, you know, you work in quant trading. One of them is a partner at one of the major uh, restaurants in uh, River North Chicago. Of course, there's the whole group of quant traders that are really bullish on Bitcoin. Some of them own a ton of Bitcoin from back when Bitcoin was trading like at 200, 300. So a lot of those guys are basically like retired, but they're still trading at work just to trade and their Bitcoin's worth millions and millions of dollars. So I guess they just hold diamond hands through all those volatile swings because, you know, quant trading is a risky career anyway. So they just have a higher risk tolerance than most people. I think the takeaway from all of the places that these quant traders invest is that if you're going to average it out across all of these people, like the guy who lost money buying silver at the top, the partner who was making speculative bets on lean hogs and live cattle and <laughs> almost blew out his whole net worth, you know, and then you compare it to, you know, some of the, the investments that probably just kind of went sideways, like the friends who maybe opened breweries or, or invested in restaurants. Um, and then you compare it to the guys who bought Bitcoin and, you know, made ridiculous returns. If, if you take the average of all of these guys, it's probably just the same as investing in the S&P 500. And so the takeaway of this video is that from my sample space of, I'd say, 20 to 30 people that I talk to, quant traders, it doesn't seem like they have any extra alpha in their decision making just because they worked within Wall Street. My point being that the skill set to perform and be successful as a trader on Wall Street is very different from the skill set to make money as a retail trader or as an investor outside of Wall Street. I circle back to the idea that the most passive investment vehicle for a person who is outside of Wall Street and no longer has all that Wall Street edge from being inside the castle of Wall Street, I think is just to invest in the broad market, S&P 500. It has the best ratio of work and effort, like maintenance <laughs> required versus returns. I mean, it's completely passive. You just let it sit there and it averages eight to 10% annually. And yeah, just seeing how all these friends and how their investments have done, I, I still stand by that. Being a conservative vanilla investor, I think that that's, that's the wise play with your money.
but let me know if you disagree in the comments. Take care.